Today's guest, Dr. Rita Harry. Dr. Harry is a neuroscientist, physician, and, pro and professor emerita at Aalto University in Espoo, Finland. Her most significant achievements relate to the understanding of brain function. She was granted many prestigious awards, including Award for the Advancement of European Science in Germany in 1987 and the Louis Jeannette Prize for Medicine in Switzerland in 2003. Additionally, Dr. Harry was a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. Thank you. Nice, nice to meet you. Um, so I saw online that you have been working in the Brain Research Lab since 1982. In your opinion, how has the environment in the scientific community changed, especially as a, like a woman in neuroscience? When you started, there probably wasn't much information on the brain, and there probably weren't that many women, and now there's like so much. So what's what's it been like watching that scene change so drastically? Oh, okay. So that's quite a broad question. So uh, I think in Finland, the equality has been pretty good, especially in medical field. And then when I somehow graduated from medical school, so we were at that time we were about uh, one third of the class were females and two thirds were males. And currently it's there even more than half are females. And so in that medical field, I did not feel any somehow gender uh, issues. But when I then entered this um, University of Technology to really uh, carry out full-time uh, full uh, brain research, so at that time, at that lab, I was the only female. But when I then left as an emerita, so I, I think uh, there were somehow uh, really these issues had changed. And for example, I had a, a very, very closely 50-50% female and male PhD students and also female and male uh, postdocs. So that's somehow I'm in fact a little bit proud about that, that I was able to have <laughs> such a good balance because it should be not go to either side. And then concerning how this field has changed. So maybe in our field, because we've been doing uh, almost all my, my uh, research time, I've been developing this magnetoencephalography. That's one recording method with where you record magnetic fields from the brain and it's somehow a little bit more complex than this EEG electroencephalography and there are certain benefits. So at that time when I started, people were, the people in neuroscience were not so much interested in these type of things because they thought that it's too unspecific. And they thought that, that real neuroscience, if you want to do, you have to make some animal experiments or you have to go to some somehow cellular physiology. And this has changed a lot since 1990s when, when there were um, new brain imaging tools like especially functional magnetic resonance imaging and also the new better devices for electrophysiology for this EG and MEG and new analysis tools. So people currently, as far as I can understand, they consider this to be a somehow solid neuroscience, what was not the case at the earlier time. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I've learned that you've studied multiple sensory functions, including auditory, tactile, visual, and multi-sensory integration. I'm a tennis player. What brain regions would be engaged during tennis play? Okay, thanks. That's a, like also quite a uh, quite a big question because, but it allows me to say that almost all your brain is involved when you play tennis. But it's also the almost all your brain is, or let's say, whole brain is involved whenever you do whatever, because it's not like the brain would work with just, uh, so that there would be just certain areas lit up in certain cases. But when you are, for example, planning movements, you have several brain regions active and the brain works as a network, not just like a single areas. So my, you, have to, you have to have your memory working, you have to have accurate senses, and really the whole network is working. So I would say that although when you're playing tennis, of course, the motor system is very important, but so is the sensory systems and especially the anticipation because you have to anticipate what your, the other player is going to do. So it's really, it's a, I would say your whole brain is involved as always. 
Would you believe that or not? <laughs> yeah, I would believe that. Yeah. Um, so I saw this article about your study on neonates, and I was wondering like what we have learned about the capabilities of the newborn brain and if you think there's like untapped potential that we haven't discovered yet. Yeah, this is in interesting because uh, in fact, um, that was just a single study that we made in units and it was, uh, it, it's not my field because it, it, it was like a part of the bigger research where we were developing new tools to study the proprioception, which this means the position sense. When you, for example, I uh, just explain what it, this means, because when you touch something, you for I, I will take this cup from here. Mm -hmm. So it's only, not only touch and not only like motor uh, models, but there's all the time information coming from the position on my hand with respect to this, this uh, cup. And there has there's not been such clinical tools to really access this position sense. Typically, how it's done in hospitals, it's that the doctor says to the patients, please close your eyes, and then I will move your toe, for example, upwards or downwards, and please tell me what <coughs> what was what did I do. And then if the person has some problem with the position sense, with his proprioception, the person probably can't tell whether the, the toe was moved upwards or downwards. But now we have developed tools um, where we passively move fingers or certain muscles. Like you saw in the movie, there was a, a doctor was moving by hand the unit's finger or hand at the intensive, intensive care unit. And it was um, like the whole purpose of that study was that we wanted to introduce and check whether this new tool would also work for these newborn babies in order to help in the, in the statement or the prognosis of some, some uh, such, um, vulnerable kids. And then it's totally, I, I think what you asked was, was uh, somehow much more important interesting and important is that what we don't know about the newborn babies. So I'm, maybe I'm not the right person to say to that, but I'm sure that because we don't know everything about the adult brains, we don't know everything about the newborn babies either. And it's somehow this, uh, all the plasticity and all, all those things. This, it's, re it's really interesting topic. So this, mm -hmm. I have to just say that this work was a collaboration with the <clears throat> Samsa, Professor Samsa Vanhatalo, who is also, who is the head of this so-called baby lab, and then my PhD student, Ero Smeets. So I was like a team member because we had developed this method mm -hmm. for proprioception, and also we had developed it for magnetoencephalography, MEG, but now we transferred it to infants and then also to other method, EEG, which is easier to apply in the intensive care unit. Yeah. Uh, what did you have to do in high school and university in order to become the world-renowned neurologist you are today? <laughs> well, in high school, so high, in high school, I probably so still before university that bit high school, I was probably all the time outside <laughs> practicing sports, <laughs> especially <laughs> skating, for example. <laughs> so. Uh, I, in this country, people, at least at that time, were not too much prepare, be, uh, preparing anything to somehow enter the university. It was pretty easy. So I haven't, um, I haven't done anything special in high school. <laughs> and then in university, so I, I was very early interested. In fact, I was interested already while I was in school. I, was, I got interested in brain. I just uh, happened to buy one book when I was 15 years old and there was something, uh, they were speaking about memory and things like that. And then after, <clears throat> when I entered university, I was very interested in mathematical neurons, which was at, at that time, it was somehow a simple modeling of simple neurons that were able, so-called McCulloch bits neurons that were just in two, two states. And little by little, I then had an access also to uh, to join a group who was making some brain research. And then it just happened that 
then somehow this field that we entered that nobody was in the beginning interested in like this developing this new technology and the new methods to study the human brain it somehow started to fly so it's just flying a kite so sometimes it goes up and then it just falls down <laughs> in this case it went there so i think in if you want to be a scientist so it, the most important is that you try to follow that field that you are really interested in and then if you find that field then try to find either good books or good mentors and teachers so that you can somehow learn the first steps so that you can get it like this driving license in science so that means your phd so that's like a driving license after that you can be independent but first you have to learn some basic stuff and try to do that with as good people as possible so that's important because there's a, like a pedigree also in science so good scientists have good students and it's etc like good dogs have good better <laughs> good puppies and etc <laughs> okay um could you tell us a little bit about the benefits of studying neuroscience in medical school in Finland? Uh, neuroscience is not really studied so much in medical schools. Uh, it's in, medic in Finland, uh, we don't have any special specialty in medical schools for neuroscience. But it's neuroscience, it, because it's so multidisciplinary, then we have separate graduate school, which it's um, for people who ha may have a background in medicine or physics or linguistics or biology so then typically it happens like that that they people join different research teams and then they also belong to this graduate school but the graduate school does not um, uh, give them uh, doctorates but the people always somehow have to defend their thesis in their like it if, if your background is in medicine, then you have to defend it in a medical school. If your background is in physics, you defend it then in physics department or university of technology. Um, many people from abroad, they uh, like to come to Finland because the universities are free. Even for foreign students, at least at present, although there's a discussion that some fee would be set there. But um, I, I think it's... It, it's in science in general it, it's a difficult or maybe it's not a good question to ask what are the benefits in doing that in a certain country unless you like the certain country <laughs> so much but maybe you should first look what kind of research team there are first look that what kind of research you would like to do and then go to whatever country according to that Okay. Um, so is there anything that you would like to say to the general audience who are going to watch this video? Uh, what is the general audience? Will, will that be like students like you or? Um, pretty, yeah, I like pretty much the general public. So as students yeah. like us or people who might uh, have. Yeah. Okay, so from the neuroscience point of view, maybe then, for example, that Brain research is extremely interesting. I think it, it should be interesting to everybody who owns that kind of organ, like we, we do, because it's, uh, it's good to know. It's also for understanding our mental functions, because so there's no mind without the brain, but the brain and mind are not identical. There are lots of uh, interesting also philosophical questions. There are lots of environmental factors that affect our brain function and also our mental stuff. So it's interesting for everybody. It's really somehow you can come it from very many different sides and it, you just should have good. Um, so if you want to be a scientist there, so then it would be good that if you would first have somehow basic, uh, some methodological skills, and then you, it's much easier then to take all the somehow the contents there mm -hmm. and vice versa. If you first go to, some, uh, let's say to such very soft, sciences so later on it's extremely difficult then to try to complete your skills with your somehow technology like or met methods like skills so if you're coming to neuroscience so i i think it's really interesting field you can find lots of things and um, just have to know that being a scientist it's somehow it, it's um maybe it's not very even 
path, but it can be, as I already mentioned, flying a kite. I always uh, <laughs> often compare science to flying kites. So it's somehow, it's great when your kite is flying on the sky. It's beautiful, from, but sometimes the wind just stops and your kite went down and what you then have to do, you have to put, take your kite again to the sky. And so you have to have that kind of uh, resilience for also some problems that might, but if you are not afraid of that kind of problems, so it's a great, great thing. And maybe I, I, I could still add because it's so nice to talk to you people who are so long away from Finland. Now that it's it, in science, it's also great that you get friends, very good friends who are in different countries. So when wherever you travel, you you will find your friends there, and so it's it's really nice global uh, thing. Thank you for that. That was a really nice analogy with the yeah. with the kite. Um, yeah. So thank you yeah. very much for um, like your insight and your answers. We're yeah. going to continue reaching out to scientists and clinicians to understand the significance of neuroscience research and to introduce valuable information to the visitors of the clinical neurophysiology social media. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank for you very much. Time. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, goodbye. Thank Good you. luck. Good luck. Good luck. In fact, uh, uh, maybe you noticed from my address that it's uh, because I've been, I moved in the same university, which is called Alta University. I, I moved to the Department of Art. So I've been like trying to now, um, trying to build bridges between neuroscience and art. So that's it somehow. Um, of, co of course, cur currently I'm busy with, with the Aina Pius. We are trying to write our second edition of our MEGEG primer. <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, there's still quite a busy times. And then also some collaborati uh, coll uh, collaborative studies with other neuroscientists. But this is now the one of the somehow important thing that what I try to do that, try to understand how artists and artistic uh, scientists, artistic researchers, how they view the world and how we could somehow make a bridge between this, which is open. open.